Hello, I'm Dan and I'm from Full Scale Conflict Commissions and I'm back here at Bris Vegas Comics for this three-part painting series using the D&D pre-primed model range from WizKids. In this episode, we're going to be painting a silver dragon from the D&D range. We're now going to start prepping the dragon for paint. We're going to do something slightly special to this. As it's a vinyl, we know we can heat it up and reposition the wings. So that's what we're going to do so that it looks more dynamic and it'll give us a better opportunity to paint the detail from outside the wings, which are currently faced in, and down the ridge spine that we can't currently see. So I'm going to use my heat gun set to about a medium setting and we're going to start with one wing first. And we don't want to rush heating this up. We want to take nice and slowly. We're also going a little bit up the wing to give us just that fraction more flexibility. We can move it down there. And now all we have to do is wait and let it cool down and it will set in position. If you had a, a container of cold water as you dip this in the cold water, it would sit immediately in this position. And you wouldn't have to wait for it to cool down. Now we're going to do its right wing, same deal. As soon as you see a little bit of flex happening from that top, it'll be ready to start bending. Make sure you take your time bending this while it's warm. Because if you go too fast, too quickly, you'll break the part off. We've trained the final in the model for its wings to span out a little bit more than from just the straight up that it was. Um, it may reset because of, of the vinyl memory of how it was cast, in which case you can always just, again with the heat gun, reheat, retrain, and over time, this will become the default position. We will also pin this model, again, so that we can paint without actually handling the model itself. But this time, I brought along a bit of brass. This is a lot sturdier than the actual wire that I used to pin the previous models. And this will give us a good hold in the connecting hole here for us to paint it. So I'm going to drill out a pilot hole first. This is not the final sized drill bit. Next, I'll use the appropriate size drill bit. And I'll, I'll follow that pilot hole nice and easily. Now, we should just be able to insert our rod. Now we have a hands-free pin. With the dragon's base, we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to put a couple of small pins into the center of this so that we can pin it to the base itself. But as you can see, there's a fair bit of warp in this. So we're actually going to use the heat gun again to warm this up and then press it flat to the surface of this base and get rid of all that wiggle that's in there. So I've given this a bit of a heat up to try and reset its memory so it's nice and flat. Uh, I think to help assist it maintaining its position on the base, instead of doing a central pin like I was intending, I'm going to put a pin in four positions at exactly the points where the flex is at its highest point. So it will force the model to be glued flat to the surface of that. So we definitely know that there's a high point right here. And there's a lot of meat there, so we don't have to be too worried about drilling right through. Now on the exact opposite side, which would be here, and we'll do another one. I'm placing my thumb over the point that the pin vise is being drilled into. If I start to feel a raise happening on the opposite side, I know I'm starting to go a bit too deep, and so I'll back the drill bit out. The last thing we want is to pierce right through and then leave an unsightly hole in the model. Again, driving in the pins with a bit of glue on them, 
in a and we're rotating it as we insert it that helps to get the glue in the hole so what we're going to do now is we're going to cut each of these down so that they can be used to locate where we want to drill on the base so the very first thing we're going to do is take it all the way down clip it about there these bases aren't that thick so that will help us make a key that we know where to drill from and then later we can come back with a file or the clippers and knock that down just a little bit more so that it won't interfere with the base sitting flush on the table. We find the position that we think works best for the base. I personally like having my material within the confines of the base. So I'm just going to make sure that it is all within the confines of the base. Back just there a little bit, I think. That should be right. And then all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press down. The sharp ends of the pins will put a registration key into the plastic and we should know exactly where to drill. These are very small, but I can tell you there's one right there. There's one right there, one right there, and then that last one is right there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to get my scalpel. I'm going to put it into the the hole that that pin created. I'm going to give it a twirl. Twirl. I'm going to give it a twirl. And that gives us a nice little hole that will stop that drill bit from skipping out when we go to actually drill out the hole. And I'll continue this on the remaining points. So I'm just going to double check. all looks pretty damn close. That's great, that's great. That's great, and that's great. Good. with the burrs down underneath that we created from drilling through, we use the scalpel. We'll just easily clean those away using the tip. Now we need to find the right hole for the right bit of wire. As you can see, heating up it wasn't quite enough to get it to sit flush. But with some, we'll reheat it. Uh, we'll have another crack at uh, making it more flush, and any glue that we apply will help that seat properly. And as you can see, there's only a tiny amount of burr on top, underneath. Sorry, that will just. Use a pin, we'll use a micro file and we'll clean that off. Oop.
What we're going to now do is take a microfile and we're going to clean the burrs off of these pins so they're nice and flush so that when it inserts into the base, you'll have no interference moving it around on the table. It's ideal to get a bit of towel or something underneath because this will make a, a bit of a mess with the metal filings. And that is all the burrs removed and cut. To help assist in painting this, now that we have these smaller pins on the outside, we're actually going to put a nice central pin so that we can attach it to our cork stopper. There's plenty of meat here, so we don't have to be too worried about going too deep. But it's only a temporary pin, so it doesn't have to be, you know, to the max. Once that's cured, we'll attach it to the cork stopper so that we can paint it without handling it. The next thing to prepare this for painting is we're actually going to mask up the stalk so that no paint gets stuck to it. And we're just going to use this, which is painter's mask, which you can get at Bunnings or a paint store. A big roll like this is only a few dollars, so it's very accessible and it's very cheap. It's also low tack, which means that you could put this over the top of a painted model and continue painting if you wanted to do stenciling and it won't rip up or the paintwork you've just done. So we're just going to tear this into smaller strips. And this will help us adhere it to the stalk so that we get maximum coverage on the stalk and no coverage on the parts that we want to paint. Just to get that little bit of the stalk down the bottom there, cover it up. We'll go a bit further with the mask than intended. As you can see, we've got a bit of the mask on the on the ground form of this model. So we're going to grab a scalpel with a stenciling blade, and we're just going to, starting from this point. We're just going to cut that mask free. I take a couple of light passes. And then it should just lift right up. With that, the stalk is covered up and this is now ready to be mounted to our cork. The last thing we need to do before we actually start painting is get rid of some of these mold lines. We're just gonna use a scalpel with a long blade on it. And essentially, we're just gonna give it a light scrape. Eventually, it'll file down that bit so that that flashing disappears and that area becomes nice and smooth. We're going to do the Silver Dragon with metallics and we're going to actually shoot the metallics through the airbrush. We have to be mindful of the particular brand of metallic that we're using so that we know how to predict the spray that's going to occur. We're going to start with a base color of Tamiya Dark Iron XF 84 and with Tamiya they have a fair amount of flake through their metallics so getting a precise shot with an airbrush is not really its forte. It's very good for doing overall base colors and for the more precise stuff we're going to come back with another brand. Just as a note with Tamiya colors it's important that you do thin it with its appropriate thinner. The Vallejo is a very specific uh, recipe as well as the Tamiya and they don't work together. So make sure that you do use the appropriate thinner for the paint that you're using. So this is our overall color using the dark iron. So we're just going to make sure that we get a nice base over the entire model using it. As you can see, the dark iron has given us quite a very dark metallic almost sort of a burnt umber with a bit of uh, 
tiniest amount of metal flake in it. So we're going to do the next layer, which is going to be metallic gray from the Tamiya range, XF56. As you can see, there is a lot of over spray from the metallics. So we just want to be very cautious with this particular color. We don't have to be overly neat with it, but we do want to control. We do want to control it just a fraction. We want to keep some of that dark iron in the recesses as best we can. And help keep it in the recesses from the scales, we're going to paint in the direction of the scale. So that should leave the underside with that darker color in it. The next color we're going to use is Titanium Gold from Tamiya X31. And we're going to focus this down across the chest plates and the plates leading all the way down on the tail. It's a very subtle, subtle gold. I might put a bit down there as well. Something just a little different. Now the main color that we're going to use to brighten this right up is from the Vallejo metal color, airbrush color range. And this is pale burnt metal. So we're very lightly building up the effect using that color. As you can see, with the pale burnt metal, it's really pumped up that silverness for our dragon. But it comes at a cost of lack of contrast. He's just one big metallic blob, really. So what we're going to start doing is some candy effects, and we're going to do it with Army Painter's Blue Tone ink. And we're going to shoot that through the airbrush, and we're going to focus around these wing parts and a little bit into the uh, the membrane as well and we can also use this as a wash and apply it to all the scales itself so it'll go into all the recesses and give it that blue shade as a note when you shoot these inks through your airbrush take your time to build up the effect in the areas that you want don't try and build it all up in one go this will take a little bit of time to dry and because of that if you focus too long on an area it's going to spider out and it's going to ruin all your work what i'm doing here to break up that membrane a bit is just a little bit of mottling and wherever you want the blue be more prominent, just go back over to that area, give it another shot, and work up that work up that color. As a note, it will cause tip dry more often, so you will need to have to clean that tip very frequently while shooting an ink through. As you can see, applying that ink has given us a bit of contrast in the areas that we're lacking. And the next step is we're going to take a bright silver and we're going to touch up things like the wing tips, the membrane and some of the scales to clean up the blue that's gone everywhere. The next step is we're actually going to use uh, Army Painter's plate mail metal and we're going to go over and clean up the areas on the membranes, on the wings and around the face and some of the scales. I'm just going to wipe a little bit of the excess off because that's a bit too much. off as you can see we've just given it a light touch up on the membranes with that silver from Amy Painter and along the uh, spine 
just to lighten it back up a bit after that blue. And the next thing we're gonna do is a enamel wash using Tamiya Sea Blue XF17. We're just going to apply this enamel wash over the entire model. We're gonna give it a little bit of time to dry and then we're gonna clean it up. Now that the enamel is dry, we get a very good level of contrast happening between the scales and in between the membrane sections. So with this, we're going to back over with some cotton tips and some enamel thinner, and we're gonna clean up the excess so that we get that silver shining back through. So I'm gonna load up the cotton tip with a bit of enamel thinner and I'm gonna wipe away the excess. With this one, we want to follow the grain of the wing. This will help push the enamel that we don't need into the furthest cracks. Remove the enamel that we don't need entirely. As you can see, the enamel wash has done a very good job of giving us lots of detail in between the scales and the membrane. It's given it kind of a tarnished appearance, which is pretty cool. So what we're going to do now is we're going to come back and give it a very light dry brush of Army Painters Shining Silver. The next step is we're going to get some hex lichen from the game color range and we're going to thin it right down to about a one part paint to six parts thinner. And with that, we're going to go over all the membranes of the wings and we're going to tint. So we will end up tinting the membranes to separate them from the overall color of the body. Now, one of the interesting things of this technique is we're going to use a bit of packing sponge. And what we're going to do is we're going to layer our very thinned purple into the membrane. And before it has a chance to actually cure, we're going to get the clean sponge and we're gonna start dabbing it away. And as you can see, it's ever so slightly glazing the wing and giving it a minute texture from the sponge. Now that we've done the glaze on the wing membranes, and I've actually run it down the center fin of the model itself, it gives us a uh, deviation between the main body and the wings and it doesn't look like one giant mouse. So the color that we're going to use for the teeth claws and eyes is going to be game color glacier blue. And the last bit for the eye we're going to paint in golden gold yellow from the game color range. So the last thing we're going to do on the dragon is we're going to define all the shadows using the flat black enamel from Tamiya XF1. We're applying this less like the wash before and much more of a focus around these areas. We'll still be able to clean it off just as easily. So we've placed the black enamel over it to start increasing the, sh the contrast into the shadow and shade areas. What we're going to do now 
is again with the with the cotton tip with the enamel thinner so we're going to clean up the excess that we don't need to get that nice verdigris green back on those areas so I'm pushing again back into the recessed areas because like oils you don't just remove it you can move it Now with the black cleaned up, we've got a nice contrast in our shadow areas and a nice overall tone for our silver dragon. So now we're going to paint the base for the dragon and again we're going to start with dark blue grey from the model colour Vallejo range. We're just going to slap this down, we're not going to be worried about the overall coverage. Thanks to the masking tape, we don't have to be too worried about getting paint onto that stalk. Now with the next bit, we're going to paint these stones on top using sand yellow from the Model Air range. The very last thing we're going to do with the base is we're going to use some Vallejo light sienna pigment, mix it with some isopropyl alcohol and we're going to just pull it all over the base. Now that we've got our mix done, we're going to apply it liberally over everything. Now that the scenic area is secured to its base, we're going to remove the painter's masks so that we can see the nice clear stand and then attach it to the dragon. With this all painted now, we're ready for the varnishing stage. And because we used a metallic to get a nice shiny silver dragon, we're not actually going to use a matte varnish on this. Instead, we're going to use Tamiya Clear X22. This is essentially a this is essentially a paint compound without any pink pigment in it. So it'll act just like a varnish, and the metallics will remain nice and shiny and not go flat from using a matte varnish on it. However, on the base, we are going to use just a matte varnish because it looks earthy and we want to make sure it stays nice and safe with that varnish. So a matte varnish won't matter for that at all. As you can see, some of the pigment did darken down when we applied our matte varnish to it. Don't worry, as this dries, that pigment will come right back up to its full color. This stuff dries very quickly, thankfully. And now we have a completed silver dragon. All the techniques we've used to paint these models are very simple. Enamels really don't require a lot of experience to get good results from. They're very easy to use and exceptionally easy to clean up. Unlike oils that require a few extra steps, enamels are a great step up into advancing your painting skills. And until next time, happy painting.